This is the GQ Coaches Show. Now, get ready to chop it up with your hosts, Coaches G and Q, for the real talk in sports. All right, hey, you know what time it is. This is Coach Goins along with the greatest co-host this side of heaven. Coach Quick, what's popping? Hey, what's good, Coach G? You want to know what's popping with Coach Q? Well, Coach Q is so excited about our very special guest via telephone tonight. I feel like I'm in my office at my desk waiting to put pen to paper with an extraordinary book author. So after this short break, Coach G and I are going to come right back, and we're going to be chopping it up with our very special guest. So make sure those cleats are laced up tight. Hey, Coach Quick, man, it is football season. Week one is in the books. I'm excited about our guest tonight. So if you have the honor and privilege of introducing our very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to some and present to others. He is the award-winning author of the book Rocket Men, the black quarterbacks that revolutionized pro football. Put those hands together and welcome to the GQ Coaches Show, Mr. John Eisenberg. Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be back on your show. It took me three years to write this book. It's finally out. It's in your hands. It's in other people's hands, and I couldn't be happier to talk about it. So really fired up for this. Yes, sir. Without a doubt. Coach Quick, man, I don't know about you, but I am ready to get down and dirty. When I say down and dirty, it is football season. Folks, so you know what? We're excited. Mr. Eisenberg is back with us. He was with us when we were on the ESPN uh, 1240 the boss he's back with us now on the podcast the gq coaches show so with that coach quick i see you you drop back in the you were a center coach so you can really appreciate hiking the ball to these you know to to a to a, a quarterback at, at, at the nfl level so with that if you don't mind go ahead and kick us off with that very first question absolutely mr eisenberg my first question for you tonight is what inspired you to investigate the history of black quarterbacks in the nfl well, uh, this is my 11th book, uh, so I've been, I've been writing books. Uh, I've written a lot of history. Uh, there was a, a, often, I've done hit, uh, football history, baseball history, some horse racing. There was often a, a, a thread in the narrative, a narrative thread of race that came, that would, came up. Certainly if you talk to the old football players from back in the day, uh, you know, black and white, uh, and you start talking to them about things, uh, you know, situations, very interesting things often come up. And uh, I'd always thought, well, this is uh, an interesting thing to uh, to investigate. And then I'm in Baltimore, where Lamar Jackson landed five years ago. And, uh, you know, of course, he's at the Combine as a prospect, and they're telling him to run uh, telling him to run the, 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 the 40 because he might be a good wide receiver. The Chargers actually asked him to do that. And so I thought, golly, I've been studying football all these years. And I cannot believe we're at a century of NFL football, pro football, and we're still dealing with a guy that good who in his second year in the league was MVP as a quarterback. How in the world could anybody have suggested he'd be a wide receiver? Because that's what happened for years for, for good black college quarterbacks. They were had to switch positions because they couldn't get to play in the pros. So if it's still happening all these years later, and I watched it, I thought, you know, this is something I need to investigate. How did we get here? How did we get this far into the history of pro football with this situation still bubbling up a little bit? So I thought, this I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to uh, spend a lot of time digging the research, the interviews, and tell this story. And, you know, how did we get here from the beginning of football to where we are now uh, with black quarterbacks? Yeah, you know what, Mr. Eisenberg, I think it's extraordinary that you put pen to paper and you investigated this history. And you're right. You're absolutely right. A talent like Lamar Jackson should have never been asked to move to the wide receiver position. As you said, he won the MVP of the National Football League in his second year. And now he just he just put pen to paper and inked the new deal. Um, he's ready to leave Baltimore to another Super Bowl now. Well, he might. Uh, he's... Uh... He's a real interesting player and uh, a great player, an unusual talent. And uh, if he had come along 50 years ago, uh, I don't believe he would have played in the NFL. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, you know, you go back to the 60s, the 70s, the 
quarterbacks, even with quarterbacks with his kind of talent, just couldn't get on the field. There was a, a, just a real, a lot of denial by stereotype, you know, the, these teams and these organizations and coaches, it was a, you know, a white power structure and they were very hesitant to uh, hand over the keys to the offense to a black quarterback, just wouldn't do it. So, uh, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, there's no doubt uh, the NFL put out a, a release that this opening weekend of the 23 season, there were 14 black quarterbacks. That's almost half the 32 teams. So we've really come a long way. Uh, but there were many years uh, to get to this point, many guys that just didn't get a chance. And that's the, some of the stories I explore in my book. Yes, sir. Coach Goins, I'll kick it over to you. Well, you know what? Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, as we said, uh, pre uh, pre production folks was just the, the courage, the, um, the willingness to do that research, you know, seeing that. And again, uh, can you imagine, uh, you know, these guys show up at combines and the first thing they ask you to do is not get in the position that basically you played all your life. And just like the cover of the book, of course, it has the uh, Warren moon uh, on the cover as well as Mahomes. But, you know, in this, and I'm, and I'm not here to tell the book because we're just to talk about the book, but there's one person in the book that you guys call out, and I want to call him out just because I'm a Steeler fan, Coach Quick, so just allow me to go here if you will. Jeff, yes, Jefferson Street Joe, what a great, great story, and I certainly appreciate you highlighting that. And what I didn't realize when I was read the book was how I didn't realize his father was a, was a quarterback in college. And it's just like, so how, and how great was – uh, Joe Gillum, for those that you know who I'm speaking of, in Jefferson Street Joe, uh, on that, and, and I didn't realize his problem was he didn't want to listen to Coach uh, Coach No, he just want to go out there, and Coach Quick, and just sling it up and down, sling it up and down the field, and that was his problem. But in the book, you know, it, though that's when you know the book is just it's just so rich with all of the history and all of the things. And you, you go back and there's another gentleman. I'll stay on this whole Pittsburgh vein. There was a guy out of new Kensington, Pennsylvania. And I know where new Ken is Mr. Eisenberg. Cause some of my relatives live in Toronto, which is just right across the Allegheny from new Ken. And there was a gentleman that you, uh, you, uh, uh had in there and his last name was throw coach quick. And can you imagine? Yeah, Willie Thrower. Yeah, can you imagine? Can you imagine? You, what, what's your name? Thrower. What position you play? Uh, quarterback, right? So in that, he, he he highlights that in the book. But that was really brought that really brought me home. Number one, being a Steeler fan, and number two, to find that uh, Mr. Thrower was from New New Kensington, Pennsylvania, where I could say, which is just right across. Uh, the Allegheny from Toronto, uh, where a lot of my relatives uh, currently live. But it's just they're just a rich, rich history of this book. We're so excited. So, folks, please jump online, order it, go get it, get a copy. Let me, I got to ask you this right here, Mr. Eisberg. Are you having a book signing in Baltimore anytime soon? I'm having a book signing in Baltimore. I am on November 9th at Snug Books, S-N-U-G. It's a... It's uh, North Baltimore. Just signing that. Uh, I am going to be also at the University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland, on October 19th. Uh, there's going to be a panel. I think Doug Williams is going to be on that panel. Oh, wow. And uh, so that'll be a big event. So several events coming this fall and more to come for sure. Oh, man. So, so, so folks, uh, mark your calendars. Coach Quick, the 9th of, Octo- uh, uh, the 9th of November. And also the, what'd you say, Mr. Eisberg, the, uh, the, the 19th, 19th, 19th of, October. of October, College Park. All right. So that's yes. a, that's a cold, you know, think about it, Coach Quick. We'll be uh, in Maryland Terrapin country, but in that, I might have to check my calendar <laughs> and try to slide it. Cause I got to get a, there's nothing. Can you, I, I got to get a signed copy. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. So with that Coach Quick, I'm going to toss it back over to you. Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenberg, what surprised you the most in your research when preparing to write this book? Well, a number of things surprised me. I guess something that surprised me is that I've been a sports writer since the late 1970s, and I did not realize some of this unfolded before my eyes. Uh, I'm in the press boxes, and I'm not even aware of it. When Warren Moon signed with the Houston Oilers in 1984, of course, undrafted after he won the Rose Bowl as a senior at University of Washington, does not get drafted, goes to Canada, uh, and uh, plays six seasons, wins five championships there, five great cups. And the NFL finally says, well, okay, I guess we'll give you a shot. Uh, and uh, so he comes to the Houston Oilers, 
1984, he is the only black starting quarterback in the NFL that season. There were none. And I thought, wow, that is incredible. Doug Williams had been with Tampa, and uh, they had not re-signed him. They basically ran him out of town, even though he made the team infinitely better. Uh, and there was no one. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I mean, you, 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 this, this happened in front of me, and I just uh, wasn't even aware of it. And, you know, shame on me. But uh, uh, so stuff like that, it just, you know, how recent uh, uh, it, 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 some of this history stretches to. You know, the, the, the NFL can finally say there's 32 teams. They have all started a black quarterback in a game at least one time. But the NFL could not say that until 2017. Wow. There was wow. still an organization it was the New York Giants had, had been in business since 1925. They had never started a black quarterback in a game until 2017. That was the last team. So now they all have, but that's six years ago. So uh, the stuff, uh, the, the, the recent, the fact that it was also recent, just, just really stunned me. Yes, sir. Hey, if I could say this, um, I'm glad Tampa ran Doug Williams out because he ended up with my Washington Redskins slash commanders and ended up winning a Super Bowl. So I was excited about that. But uh, in other words, they shouldn't have ran him out, but I'm glad that they did as a fan of the Redskins. That was big for me. Could you touch on guys like Sandy Stevens and Eldridge Dickey? Um, you talked about how they could have broken, broken in the NFL if they They've been given the support that other black quarterbacks are giving today. Absolutely. These are guys in the 60s. Sandy Stevens is the early 60s. We are going back. In 1962, I believe it was, he came out. He was at the University of Minnesota, and he he won a Rose Bowl, played in two Rose Bowls, uh, was the first-team All-American quarterback, the first black quarterback to be first-team All-American. Now, he was more of a runner than a thrower, but he was just a, a clutch player, an incredible quarterback. And uh, he never played a down of pro football in the United States as a quarterback. I mean, he, he had to go to Canada. The Cleveland Browns drafted him. They wanted to move him, change positions, wouldn't let him play quarterback. The New York Jets, there were two leagues in. The New York Jets wouldn't let him play. And so he signed in Canada, and he spent his pro career in Canada. What a what a shame uh, that he didn't even get it. That's what I was talking about. The you know it's the story of opportunity. He did not get it. Uh, and then Elder Zicky, uh, uh, an amazing story in the late '60s, uh, coming out of Tennessee State with just a, had all that he could throw, just as far left handed as right handed. He could run like the wind. He, he was uh, just an incredible talent, and the Oakland Raiders took him in the first round and just stunned the football world, took a black quarterback from an HBCU in, fir- in the first round. and uh, But they took Kenny Stabler in the second round, and uh, they asked Elders to change positions, and he never played a down of quarterback in the NFL. And you think, golly, these are guys that really just were superior talents to not even get the chance, can you imagine? And that really drives home uh, how difficult it was for so long. This is John Eisenberg, author of Rocket Men, The Black Quarterbacks Who Revolutionized Pro Football. And you are listening to the GQ Coaches Show, the real talk in sports. Hey, this is Pete Chilka, North Carolina Tar Heel and NBA champion. You're listening to the GQ Coaches Show. Hey, this is Chris Patola, and you're listening to the GQ Coaches Show on the real talk in sports. Hey, we're back in. This is Coach Goins along with Coach Quick and our very special guest. When I say nothing, he is a special guest, Coach Quick, but he's been on the show before, right? So it's just like, feel like, yes, when, you know, feel like he, feel like my lock is on the left, uh, Mr. Eisenberg's in the middle, and you're on the right hand <laughs> side. So as we, as we continue to chop this thing up and talk about this fantastic project that is out, Rocket Man. Uh, the the history of the black quarterbacks in the NFL. Folks, you've got to get this. It's a must-read. If you call yourself a football fan, you better have this on, on your, in, in your library. So here's a question I want to go to, Mr. Eisenberg. So we see that Coach uh, Coach Prime is taking over college football, actually taking over the sports world. You just talked about before we stepped away how the HBCU quarterback. How do you, what, What's your take on – and you know what? Here it is. Shadua Sanders, he's out there. 
Your book is out there. What the timing of this, when people say, hey, this guy comes from HBCU, he can't do this, he can't do this, and his first game he puts up 510 yards, your thoughts? <laughs> really true uh, I, I didn't see that coming but uh it, it just drives home exactly what the story is which is uh he what did what did Shadur sanders get he got an opportunity his dad's a coach <laughs> he, he he changed uh, got to change schools a lot of guys don't get that opportunity he did uh you know for his uh, good for him and is he did he make the most of it absolutely and uh really the talent the talent is not the question uh, because he's got it, uh, and just because he's playing at HBC, it means nothing. Exactly. I mean, there, you know, he, the talent is is there. So it's a question of, you know, does he get the opportunity to show the the extent of it? And uh, he is getting it, that young man, and uh, so great for him because he's coming along at a time where things have changed and teams are not seeing color at quarterback, uh, you know, very little or not at all. So it's a great time to be coming along. So to his great benefit, it's really something to watch. I'll say that. And, uh, you know, I hope he continues to do well. Excellent. I certainly appreciate you taking me, letting you uh, jump in the car. Let me take that hard left coach quick. I'll kick it to you. Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenberg, could you share with our listening audience one of your most memorable stories that you uncovered in your research? Well, sure. Well, I, I interviewed James Harris, who played uh, quarterback, came out of Grambling uh, in 1969, was drafted uh, six foot four, 220 pounds, big arm, Dean's List student, everything could not possibly have a better pro prospect. He goes in the eighth round, uh, you know, well after a bunch of white quarterbacks who've never sniffed a roster in the NFL. He goes in the eighth round to the Buffalo Bills, and he goes up there to Buffalo to try to make the team. There are no black quarterbacks in football. And James recounted this story to me. Uh, he's a great guy to talk to. And he goes up there. As I said, O.J. Simpson's his teammate. They put O.J. up at the, the Hilton. They put James up at the Y, $6 a night. Wow. And uh, he's up there, and he says uh, – he goes to the team. It's not like it is today. There's no agent. His college coach, Eddie Robinson, legendary coach, is negotiating with Buffalo his contract. And so James goes to him and says, look, you know, I, 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 need, I need a little bit of money here while we're negotiating this. Can I get a, a front? You know, i got to go get a sandwich or something every now and then. And uh, they they gave him a job. They gave him a job cleaning his teammates' cleats in the locker room. That's the Buffalo Bills did that in 1969. And so he is doing that for a little while. That stopped, and uh, practices start, and he winds up winning the starting job that year in training camp. He plays so well. Uh, he starts the opener, uh, and they doesn't do that well, and they never really – Three years in, he's in Buffalo. They don't let him back on the field hardly. And uh, then he's out of football for a year. It looks like his career is over. Then the Rams revived him, and he wound up getting on the field. And uh, the Rams, he started for two seasons and led him to the NFC Championship game twice, had a great record, and was a great quarterback. Then they took his job away, too. So it was a real star-crossed career, but... Uh, what I mean, can you imagine any of that stuff today uh, going on? I mean, you know, giving him a job like that, just an incredible thing. He re he recounts the story. I asked him a question. He talked for 45 minutes. <laughs> I tell you, <ya, laughs> he's an amazing guy to talk to. And uh, what a story he tells. Those going. Man, you can you imagine that being drafted in the eighth round? You wind up having to stay at a six dollar a night hotel room at the YMCA. Your legendary, your legendary teammate OJ Simpson is staying at the Hilton, but you end up winning the job that year as the starting quarterback on opening day. But you're cleaning your teammates' cleats. That's just can you imagine that? That was the league, man. And 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 again, that's why this book is so important because it's history. Yes, sir. People have, you know, people see now I walk up and if I'm at the press conference, I got my gold, you know, I got my bling on. I've signed for $400 million, you know, $250 million is guaranteed. These young guys, that's and I'm calling these guys out that's in the league, they need to read this book. They need yes, to understand sir. that they're sitting there and they, they, they have, and I'm not saying they haven't worked, 
but they have done so much off of these guys' back. They need to make sure that they appreciate these guys. But can you imagine walking in there and say, hey, go clean them cleats? Man, there'd be so many lawsuits come flying at you. And be, but again, yeah. you know, and, though, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that, you know, these guys don't appreciate that. But when they sit down and negotiate these hundreds and, you know, millions and millions of dollars of con, uh, contract, how many people before then were never given, uh, you know, they couldn't even sniff the grass, you know, needed to say not even getting behind the center. So that, and that's why this book is so important. And that's why I'm so excited. And just like the cover, the cover, to me, the cover means so much. When you pick up a book yes, and people say, you know, what, what's, the, you know what, I'm going to ask, I'm going to go ahead and go here. Again, I'm kind of off the script a little bit, but in that Mr. Eisenberg, what, what, what made you, how did you select Warren Moon and Patrick McHolmes to be on the cover of this project? Well, it's interesting when you're in my position as the author, I work, I mean, this, uh, you know, it's a publisher put this book together and they paid to put it together and uh, they're in charge of that. Uh, but they did ask my advice. They said, what should we do here? How are we going to illustrate this? And I said, well, I think maybe two or three guys from different eras would be good. And so I gave them some choices. I said, you can do this, you can do that. I said, really, the best choice to me, certainly the one that today's uh, readers would understand is Patrick Mahomes. You know, and he, he is the heir. He's the one that's come uh, to talk about making it off the backs of these guys. He's doing it. Of course, he's earning it. Sure. You know, the best best quarterback in football and and to his great credit by the way he understands that he's making it off the back of some of these guys uh but uh um uh, warren moon i'd say I, I just don't think anyone has done more for the black quarterback than as i said when he came into the league there were none and he spent the next 16 years playing that position with as a as an elite quarterback there was no – you watch him play for five minutes, and you knew, boy, that, that is a quarterback. <laughs> and so you could not watch Warren Moon play football and say, you know, that he was anything other than a first-rate quarterback. And, of course, all the stereotypes for so long that denied him, you know, you know, was he smart enough? Could he lead? Would he put in the time? You know, so many just, you know, racist thoughts about that, that it kept these – black quarterbacks out of the league warren moon disproved them all he yes. proved he he proved disproved them all and i said i think you put him at the top i think you're fine so yeah. that's uh, that's what i went with and fortunately <laughs> my publishers agree uh, they're in charge of that but uh, they found a good picture and it worked out great excellent excellent coach quick i see you ready man Yes, sir. Mr. Eisenberg, you have written a lot of books on sports history, especially history of football. Did you face any new challenges during this project that you did not encounter in previous works? Well, I did. Um, uh, number number one, I, I wrote this. It took me a long time. Some of it took place during the pandemic, you know, when I'm stuck at home. And uh, it was hard to get out and interview people. And uh, that was certainly a challenge I didn't anticipate. But uh, that was true for any author, I think, in, in this time. And the other thing that was new in this book uh, for me, this, as I said, my 11th book, most of my other ones, uh, they cover a relatively short time span, whether it be one year or three years, five years at the most. This one's 100. This one, I go all the way back to Fritz Pollard, the first black quarterback in 1923, and I go through Jalen Hurts, you know, from, from Fritz Pollard to Jalen Hurts and beyond. That's 100 years. So I had a number of eras I had to research and get down what was going on on the field and off the field and that civil rights situation and what was happening and make sure the context was right. It was just a lot of eras, a lot of guys, a lot of research. And so that's uh, that was a lot. And uh, you get to some of these uh, current players, it's, it's harder and harder to get a hold of people. I'm not going to lie to you. They don't uh, – they, uh, you know, social media has changed things, and they like to, they like to put the things out themselves. A lot of them have their own YouTube channels or whatever, so it's harder to talk to people. So I had to ride around that a little bit. So those are some of the challenges that I faced, but uh, it was nothing that I, that couldn't be overcome. You know, it, it took three years, but it finally happened. Yes, sir. I'd just like to say kudos, uh, outstanding job uh, getting through all the challenges that you had to face, especially during COVID times. You know, that was a lot to deal with. And um, you handled it. You handled adversity like no other. You stood up and you knocked it out in the park. So I'd just like to say congratulations on this project. Um, and I'm reading it now. And it's just it's an outstanding book. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. 
Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the I appreciate the praise. You know, there's a lot of authors, a lot of books come out. Some of them don't get a lot of attention. I I, I never take it lightly. I'm glad when anybody takes the time to read it and uh, and uh, give it a shout out. Uh, I take it as high praise. So uh, thank you so much for that. Yes, sir. Coach Steve, kicking it over to you. All right, Mr. Eisenberg, we're going to go here. For this book, you've interviewed many of the central figures in the uh, National Football League history. Like you mentioned earlier, Mr. James Harris and Mr. Doug Williams. What was this experience like for you as an author and a sports fan? Well, uh, you know, I love doing this. Warren Moon would be another one. I interviewed Ozzie Newsom, who was a general manager of the Ravens, and uh, was another one. Uh, he uh, uh, was a quarterback in, uh, in high school and had to change positions. He says, it worked out okay. I said, yeah, it worked out okay. He's in the Hall of Fame uh, <laughs> as a tight end. So, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I love interviewing these guys, and, and uh, it's what I do. I've done it before. And uh, what I find is, uh, you know, if you get them to relax and tell, they love telling stories about the old days, you know, whether they be uh, happy or sad or, or tough or whatever they went through, uh, you get a few years on them, they love to, you know, they're glad that people remember what they did. And uh, I, I never fail. I, I wrote a book about the Vince Lombardi Packers, uh, the first year of Vince Lombardi's year up there. I interviewed all those old Packers. Half of them are in the Hall of Fame black and white, and, and uh, you know, what a great experience talking to those guys. I love that generation of, of, of football player. You know, they're pretty humble. They didn't necessarily make the big, big money, and uh, they love to talk about the stories and what they did, and so that is really the same with these guys that I talked to. Just uh, never ceases to be a pleasure to talk to them. Excellent, excellent. Coach Quick, if you're interested in that book, the name of that book is That First Season. It's got coach, yeah, I'm it, definitely interested. It's got Coach Lombardi on the front. Just, you know, just saying. I mean, you know, I'm just, just, just trying to do a little bit of history there. All right, Coach, I'll kick it to you. Yes. The 2023 Super Bowl is the first time there were two black starting quarterbacks. How would you describe the journey that black NFL players had to go through to get to this point? Was it a gradual, continuing progress, or were there a lot of setbacks on the way? Well, there were definitely setbacks. It was gradual uh, and slow. Really slow. I mean, we're talking. We're beyond the hundred. We're beyond the hundred-year birthday of the NFL. And Super Bowl Fifty-Seven. Uh, stop and think about that. Fifty-seven took fifty-seven Super Bowls for that to happen. Wow. Even though uh, there have been, uh, you know, uh, the, the NFL has had a majority of population of uh, black players. It's been over 50 percent for decades, you know, since the 90s, I would say. And so it still took that long for the quarterback position to come around. So uh, I would say uh, it's a triumph. It was a great thing to see. But I would say it was also an indication of what could have been. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, like I said, the, 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 of course, uh, Patrick Mahomes, incredible talent. Jalen Hurts is the same. And uh, that was a moment to, to stand and applaud. But it's important to remember that for them to succeed, a number of guys went through a lot of heartache. And uh, it was a delayed situation here, a very, very slow progress. There were many years where teams just continued to want those drop-back quarterbacks, you know, predominantly white, uh, that uh, they were stuck on that cookie-cutter mold. They wouldn't get around it, and it cost guys their careers. And so uh, it's always uh, important to, to just remember that. You know what, Mr. Eisenberg, I honestly think we could possibly see it two years in a row. Because, I mean, when you're thinking about you think about quarterbacks like Dak Prescott, Jalen Hurts from the NFC, I think those two have the best opportunity to get get to the Super Bowl this year again. And then I think about the AFC, you got Lamar Jackson, you got Deshaun Watson. Then, of course, you got Patrick McHolmes, who I think is the best quarterback in the game today. I honestly believe one of those three guys will be representing the AFC in the Super Bowl this season and Dak Prescott or Jalen Hurts both have an opportunity to get to the Super Bowl from the NFC side. So it's very, it's a real possibility that we could see it again in Super Bowl yeah. 58. Well, I'll tell you what, if the Cleveland Browns are in it and uh, with Deshaun Watson, uh, now that's going to be a story. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> okay. don't, don't count them out with, with the way 
they put it on um, Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals over the weekend, I, it would not surprise me with Deshaun yep. Watson. Deshaun Watson, he's a very capable quarterback. He is. Yep. And he can lead that team to a Super Bowl. He is. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm here in Baltimore. They've been, I've been watching Cleveland for years. Not been good sledding there, but they look like they got a pretty good team. Certainly a great defense and a very good quarterback. So yes, uh, curious to see how all that develops. That'll be real interesting. Yes, sir. Coach G, I'll kick it over to you. Well, you know what? You you you, you like you, you set me up, Coach Quick. So here's here's my next question for Mr. Eisenberg. As the NFL season kicks off, what challenges do you think the black quarterback and other black players continue to face today? Well, there there are some. I mean, there there is no doubt. Even though I believe that the number this year of the league is fifty eight percent black players and people of color at sixty seven, something like that. So predominantly, however, there's no doubt it is a it is a, a it, it, the power structure in the NFL is white. I mean, it's uh, you know the ownership is white. Uh, uh, way too many of the coaches. 32, there's, I think, three minority coaches this year. I can't remember the number exactly. It's not enough. It's a real problem, and that's really where there's a, a, a battle going on right now is to get that number up. And uh, general managers only recently have started to increase the number of, of black general managers. So, you know, black players still deal with the fact that, uh, you know, this league, uh, the, the decision makers are overwhelmingly white. And so, uh, you know, they have, the, the Ravens just put out a, a, a picture on social media this past week uh, where their quarterback room, uh, the, the all three of their quarterbacks plus the position coach and the assistant position coach are all black. That's a first. It was the first time that it ever happened. Wow. So, uh, you know, the fact that they put that out there tells you it's still an issue. So, uh, you know, they have to deal with that for sure. And uh, uh, and where uh, what they have to deal with uh, the black quarterbacks is where they're can still be improvement. I mean, if you are Patrick Mahomes or Lamar, one of these guys, you come into the league, and, you know, they, they see talent. The, the, the NFL is ready. Whoever's talented, you're going to play. Exactly. But what you're not seeing enough is the white, that's the black backup quarterback. You're not seeing, you don't see guys that just bounce around for 12 years, uh, hold the clipboard, and, uh, you know, that's still, that population is majority white for sure. And, and that's a real uh, launching pad to a coaching career. Uh, those 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 guys that spend all those years in meetings and learning the game, that's how you learn the game and become a coach. And uh, that position is still backup, is still majority white. So that's where it would be nice to see some improvement. Exactly. Coach Quick, man, is, I see you scrambling back there. So what you got? Absolutely. I'm, I'm ready to toss this next question out to Mr. Eisenberg. Um, how does your research help us understand the broader discussions regarding institutional racism in the United States? Well, I, th I think this is a, this is a uh, uh, it's an indicator of exactly what has gone on for so long. I think the story mirrors the situation in other realms of society in terms of the ability for uh, uh, you know the the ability for white uh, where there's white decision makers in charge uh, to grant uh, leadership to blacks. I mean, you know, black leaders. This is a story about the slow development of black leadership. Uh, uh, period, and it happens to be it's in football, but uh, and I did put it in the book, you know, to make sure that everyone understands that, you know, the first CEO of a Fortune 500 company, black CEO, I believe that was in the late 80s, uh, the first, uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't have it in front of me right now, first uh, uh, joint chiefs of staff, uh, black joint chiefs of staff, or, or uh, I, I'm trying to remember the military was also in the late 80s, and so, you know, the, it was a similarly slow thing in other realms of society. The law, uh, there's no question it's been the same, uh, very slow to see, you know, black judges. And, and, of course, it's changed in those segments of society as it has in football. But I think the story uh, very much uh, mirrors, uh, uh, you know, what's going on. In the rest of America, you know, this uh, you can understand a lot from understanding what black quarterbacks went through. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I'll just like to sit here and say and challenge our listening audience. Go out and get this book. Rocket Man, the black quarterbacks who revolutionized pro football. 
go out and get this book, whether you got to order from Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, whatever book locations that you, you purchase your books from, go out and get this book by Mr. John Eisenberg. You will not be disappointed. It's an outstanding book and it's touching on a lot of bases. So go out and check it out. Coach Goins, I'll kick it over to you. Hey, what we're going to do, we're going to step away as we start to put the wraps up on this with our very special guest, Mr. John Eisenberg, author of Rocket Men. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Coach Mike Apple, head men's basketball coach and athletic director of St. Hills Community College, and you're listening to the GQ Coaches Show. This is Matt Doherty, and you're listening to the GQ Coaches Show, the real talk in sports. This is Bobby Collins, the head men's basketball coach at D. Shaw University, and you're listening to the GQ Coaches Show, the real talk. Hey, this is Kenny Anderson, fifth men's basketball coach, and you're listening to GQ Coaches Show, the real talk in sport. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in, so I hope you have enjoyed our time again, our second time around. First time we had Mr. Eisenberg, we were just doing a preview of what was out. Now the product is out. It's, you know what? You own it, right? When I say you own it, you go get it. And I know some people out there and I'm going to come at you hard and say, have you got the book? Just, you just, right. I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to quote coach prime. Okay. Instead of saying it's coming, I'm going to say it's out, right? The book is out. You need to get it. You need to read it. If you want to know the true history of such a historic position, uh, in the NFL, and everybody knows it's all about your quarterback. So with that, here's the closing question. Mr. Eisenberg, do you think the most important takeaway that the readers, particularly football fans, will gain from Rocket Man? Well, I, I, the most important takeaway to me is to understand we, we're living now in an era where teams are not seeing uh, color much. If at all, there's a range still in pro football, and that's a great thing, and it's uh, it's a sign of progress. Uh, but uh, as I said before, uh, I think the takeaway is, uh, as great as it is, it's an indication of what could have been mm-hmm. because there's just so many years. This is, uh, this is why I wrote the book. There were just so many years where – uh, you know, black quarterbacks were denied the opportunity to play. I think it's important to shine a light on these stories. Uh, you know, the world we're living in right now, let's make sure this is something that happened. All right. Decades, decades of denial by stereotype. It happened. And uh, I, I want to shine a light on it and for people to understand that it did happen and that, uh, you know, it, it, you should that makes you appreciate what's going on today. Most importantly, makes you understand. Let's be sure that it doesn't happen again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Coach Quick, I'm going to kick it to you for your closing comments. Mr. Eisenberg, I just like to say to you, thank you, thank you, thank you. First and foremost, for putting this project out, bringing notoriety to black quarterbacks in the NFL, and you know, just bringing notoriety to to these issues in America um, that African Americans have to experience. We actually we thank you for this time, this opportunity, for allowing us to sit here and chop it up with you about your latest project. And just coming back on our show, it's, it's been a complete blessing for us. we like to take the time out to say thank you to Miss Cindy Byrne for putting us in contact with you. It's an absolute pleasure to sit here and chop it up with you. And we look forward to having you on our show once again uh, during your next project. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we bid you Godspeed. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you guys. You all are the best, and uh, I'll, I will come on with you anytime. And uh, it's just a pure pleasure, and uh, I appreciate you letting me come on here and talk about this book. Uh, the more people that can find out about it, the better. So uh, I take your kind words as the highest form of praise. Thank you. Yeah. For Coach Goins, our very special guest, the author of the book Rocket Men, the black quarterbacks that revolutionized pro football, Mr. John Eisenberg, and for myself, Coach Quick, we'll see you in the locker room. You have been listening to the GQ Coaches Show with Coaches G and Q, the real talk in sports.